But quickly, continuing along, the third reason why Romanism, and this is the, the first uh, new information this evening, but I wanted to review that to bring the rest of you up to speed. The Roman Catholic Church has perverted the Bible by substituting tradition. Do you remember when Jesus Christ, in chapter 23 of Matthew, excoriated the religious leaders of the day? Do you remember what he said? He said, you have put your traditions over the Bible. Now, isn't it interesting that that same thing would happen in the church of Jesus Christ? The scriptures tell us that there is no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 9, paid it all. And since the Old Testament priesthood had been succeeded by the perfect priest, Jesus Christ, that offered one sacrifice forever, that there was to be no more ongoing sacrifice of sin. But the Roman church in the year 1215 had a priest named Rodbertus who debated fiercely with all of the bishops and all the leaders and finally convinced them that the only way to hold the church together was to say that the church performed transubstantiation. That the church could take at an altar in front of the congregation normal bread, normal wine, and through an incantation turn the host into the very body of Jesus Christ to be worshipped. And actually, at a Roman Catholic Mass, the host is held up to be worshipped. Why? Did they think of that overnight? No. It was the gradual raising of tradition and the gradual reducing of the Scripture. Why do you think that the people were not allowed to read the Bible? Why do you think that the Bible was kept in Latin and locked up on the altar in front of the church? Why do you think that, that during the Reformation that people were anathematized for reading the Bible? Why? Well, as I said last week, you never have to defend the Bible. Just turn it loose. Let people start reading it, and it will liberate them. It will set them free. One monk who agonized for years, who was afraid of death, who joined the priesthood because lightning struck near him and startled him, and he fell down on his face and cried out to St. Anne, Mary's mother, which isn't in the Bible either, uh, and cried out and said, Oh, St. Anne, I will serve you all my days as a monk. And that monk went and nearly killed himself, laying during the winter on a cold earthen floor by barely eating until he was emaciated, by offering every type of penance that he could offer, by actually, through flagellation, hurting his own body, by torturing himself. That man could never do enough to get to God. So finally, his overseeing priest, the overseeing monk of his order of Benedictine monks, said, why don't you go and teach the Bible? at Wittenberg. Why don't you go there? That will help you. And so young Martin Luther began teaching the Bible. And when he got to Romans chapter 1, he learned something very interesting. Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And here's the most often repeated Old Testament quote in the New Testament. Here it is. For the righteous man or the just man shall live by faith. And that monk who had done everything humanly possible to please God who would come before the people trembling to offer the Mass because he was told he was actually making the body and blood of Christ. And that man who would hold that up with trembling hands and, and merely in trepidation, afraid that God would strike him down with lightning. That man one day standing in front of a congregation of people in a college town, Roman Catholic Church, preached on this text, and all of a sudden, his eyes were opened, and he said, the righteous man will live by faith. He said, I didn't need to climb Pilate's 33 steps on my knees. I didn't need to make pilgrimages and walk barefooted over the passes of the Alpine mountains to get to Rome. I didn't need to beat my body with a whip. By faith, I can be acceptable to God. And that started the Reformation. 
And what that man did was he took some normal pieces of paper and in the Latin language wrote down 95 questions he had that he wanted to discuss in a public debate with church men. And they're called theses. And he didn't challenge the church. He just said, let's talk about this. He says, I just found some stuff in the Bible that you might not know about. You know what the church said? We don't want you teaching the Bible. We don't want you teaching those people to read the Bible. We don't want you telling those people they have to come by faith. Leo X said, I have a basilica, St. Peter's, to build in Rome. It's going to be the largest church in the world. It's going to cost more than any other church in the world. And I want the people to offer their indulgences to fund my church. And thus, with a crack of Martin Luther's back, he couldn't take it anymore. He said, that, that was one straw too many. And he started going against the tradition of the church. Well, it's not just the tradition of the Mass. Another tradition, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, and if you can't find it, write it down. You can find it later. But I want you to realize that there's a false tradition in Romanism that the Old Testament priesthood has continued on with a select group of people that are priests. And that select group of men that are priests are going to confer grace through the offering of the sacraments. You know what the Bible says? That Jesus Christ did something. He abolished the old. Now, there's a continuity between the old and new covenant. It isn't an abrupt like that. You know, the old was bad and we got rid of it and the new started. There's a real continuity there because the old points to Christ. It's beautiful. And that's why we have to watch out for a lot of the dispensational teaching that says that, like I was just in a course recently where someone asked a professor, they said, well, what about this verse in Matthew? And the professor said in the class, he said, no, no, that's, uh, that's Old Testament. I went, Old Testament? Old Testament? That's Jesus Christ talking. But you have to watch out, even in Protestantism, of cutting the Bible too finely and, and dividing it into little pieces all Scripture is given by inspiration, and there's a very clear teaching that the old economy, every part of it, pointed to the new. One of the wonderful things that, that Matthew does, Matthew, more than anybody else, is showing Judaism being fulfilled. And that's why Matthew shows the great earthquake, and he shows the tombs being opened, and he shows the, the um, resurrection of the Old Testament saints walking around and testifying of Christ after Christ's resurrection. But another thing he does is Matthew tells us that when Christ said, it is finished, and when that earthquake came, and when God turned the lights out, it says that God cut the veil of the temple from top to bottom. Actually, he tore it in half. Why? Because he said, now the way into the holiest place is open for everyone through Jesus Christ. We don't need a bunch of priests wearing little bells tinkling on the bottom of their robes with pomegranates intermingled with them, walking in like this with a rope tied to their foot in case they did something wrong and God killed them on the spot and they'd have to be pulled back out because they had profaned God. We don't need any more for them to be going through all this rigmarole of, of doing rituals of slitting throats and catching blood and slaying animals and putting them on the altar and piling them the right way and dumping the blood in a certain spot. We don't need that anymore. Why? Because, look at verse 9. Now God has called us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, it should really rejoice your heart that in the Old Testament, women could not approach God directly. They had to come through a priest. Do you know what the Scriptures tell us in the New Testament? That men and women and boys and girls can come intimately into the very presence of the Holy God because you are a priest And Jesus Christ has opened the way. Jesus Christ has said, all of us are priests. Not just people that wear backward collars. Not just people that that say that they're going to be celibate for life and marry the church. But to all who will marry Jesus Christ, who will embrace him, who will be engaged to him, who will be his bride. That's us. You, tonight, by faith, can be a priest of God. And you can come into His presence and you can come knowing that you can call Him not distant, eternal inhabitor of of heaven, but Father, because He's opened the way for you. And Roman tradition robs the saints of their standing 
Look at uh, Revelation chapter 5. We haven't seen this for a few weeks. By the way, we're still in our Revelation series. This is going to answer a lot of questions when we get to Revelation 17. Because I'll explain when we get to Revelation 17 uh, what's going on there. But chapter 5 and verse 10. One of the things that born-again Christians are going to rejoice about throughout all eternity. And all of eternity is going to be looking back on what God did through Christ on Calvary. And we're going to be looking back and we're going to go, wow. Oh, the wonder of it all. It's just so wonderful. And here's one of the songs we're going to sing. A new song. Revelation 5.10. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Do you realize that? One of your joys of heaven is going to be rejoicing in the fact that you're a priest of God. That's part of what we're going to do forever. That's why it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you give yourself in a spiritual act of worship to God. That's the consecration of us, totally dedicating ourselves so we can be priests in holiness before him. 